the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Pacific Story. In the mounting fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on ever greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and the millions of people who live around this greatest sea. The drama of the people whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here, as another public service, is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. Tonight's Pacific story, Conquest by Japanization, comes to you as another public service with drama the past and present. Featured on tonight's program also is Corporal Willard E. Hall of Portland, Oregon, one of the survivors of the Japanese prison ship torpedoed by an American submarine. Conquest by Japanization. Flying Japanese submarines at sea in the vicinity of Bintan within 40 miles of Singapore. The fishing boats may be the same ones which recently were in communication with units of the Japanese Navy. By 1938, the Japanese Nanshin Run, or March to the South, was well underway. For years before this, with gold and insidious propaganda, they'd been laying the groundwork for their coming invasion. The Japanese generals in Tokyo knew all about Singapore. It is an island on the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula. The city of Singapore is on the south shore of the island. And the British naval base is here on the north shore. A Japanese finger indicates the naval base on a detailed chart. Singapore is a fairly small, 217 square miles, but it is important. By important, he means this. Singapore has an excellent harbor. One of the busiest ports in the Far East. Singapore commands all the shipping through the Straits of Singapore. There is a causeway from the island to the mainland, and this carries both a highway and a, a railroad. The Japanese generals knew all this. They had ambitious plans for Singapore. They spoke of Nanyo. Nanyo is the land of the southern seas. And they spoke of Nanshin Ron. Nanshin Ron is the doctrine of the march to the south. The lands of the south, where they would someday march which they would someday invade and seize and occupy. So they needed detailed information, and they got it. The approach to Singapore is one of the most beautiful in the world. Japanese NYK steamships passed in full view of the city, within three miles of the shore. The three most fascinating views are the one across the Straits of Johar at the causeway, the gap over the Pasir Panjang Hills, and the East Coast Road where it skirts the beach and the headland. The Japanese got these facts in pictures photographs by the hundreds. And meantime, they were penetrating Singapore and its back country and all the surrounding vicinity. In Singapore itself, they set up business. This is the Nippon Bayaku Kaisha. We deal in drugs, chemicals, surgical, and dental instruments. This is Yakuko Sanyo. We operate a fishing fleet. We deal in fish and shellfish and fishing tackle, and also in land and marine engines. This is Daido Yoko. We deal in cartons and porcelain. Other Japanese went into the bicycle business, the curio business. Some set themselves up as photographers, taxidermists, barbers, or restaurant operators. They're becoming more and more numerous here. They're becoming more numerous all over Southeast Asia and the Southwest Pacific. They seem to be taking advantage of the world depression by flooding these markets with their cheap goods. It's even more than that. Yes? Yes. They're trying to ship their goods in by Japanese vessels, handle the transactions through Japanese banks and sell the goods to Japanese firms. And build a Japanese monopoly? That's what they're working toward. And there is still a more dangerous angle. Singapore here is one of the most important naval bases in the Far East. The more Japanese we have here, the more eyes there are on Singapore. The 
Japanese set up companies in Japan and in Formosa to develop trade in the South Seas. They took note of the fact that 85% of the world's rubber and 80% of the world's tin comes from the region of the Dutch Indies and Malaya. They noted the iron mines in the Philippines and in Malaya, the oil and bauxite in the Dutch Indies. They contrived to lay the groundwork for the day when they would move in and try to take them over. You misunderstand us. But, Mr. Nico, you as a Japanese consul here should know that Japan has nowhere near the investment out here that the British and the Dutch and the Americans and the Chinese have. What you must see is that although Japan seems to sell more here in proportion to her investment here, we buy great quantities of your products, such as the rubber and tin and scrap iron and oil. But for the past few years, Japan has been supplying the bulk of the imports in this region. Oh, it must not be supposed that Japan's investments here are small. We have... $68 $68 million invested in the cultivation of rubber and $34 million invested in mining. Besides that, we are spending great amounts of money in the development of oil production in the Indies. So you see... Like a giant not... amoeba, they spread to the southward, filling every nook and cranny. They would establish Japanese channels of trade within the countries, and when they were established, they would expand them. And while businessmen were doing this, there were other evidences of the growing interest of the Japanese. You see? There they are, down there in the woods. Yes, five of them. Interesting places for them to have a picnic. Right up here in the Pasir Pangjang Hills. Yes, right in the vicinity of the Gap. Let's go down and have a talk with them. Come along. I have an idea that there's more to this than on the surface. We are only having a picnic out here. Mm Mm-hmm. Why do you select this place to have your picnic? Oh, very pleasant here. Very quiet. Work hard every day. Come out here to rest. What is your name? The name Hikutaro Ogawa. What is your work? What do you do? I am carpenter. Carpenter. Oh, oh yes. You have a shop near the causeway, don't you? Don't understand. Causeway? Causeway. The concrete bridge across the water to the mainland. Oh, yes. Bridge, yes. I very busy work every day, so come out to rest. Were you out on the East Coast Road, oh, uh, three or four weeks ago? Three, four weeks? I can't remember. Out on a picnic like this, near the headland. I remember him now. Same chap. Oh, yes. It's Sunday afternoon. Very nice day. You liked it out there? Yes. Very nice, very nice. What's that you've got in your hand? Let me see it. Yes? Oh, it's a picture. Very bad me very bad with pencil. What does this look like to you? I'd say it's a pretty good likeness of the gap through the hills here. Uh, what is this for? Oh, nothing. No good. You like? Yes. You haven't missed many details. You like, you keep. Huh? Thank you. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to move out of here. Picnics are not permitted in these hills. Japanese workmen, almost inconspicuous before this, now seem to be found at strategic points everywhere. At desolate spots along the coast, at out-of-the-way inlets, in houses in the vicinity of the naval base, and in fishing boats, not only in the immediate vicinity of Singapore, but at the strategic points throughout the Indies and Malaya. Confidential. Japanese fishing boats are operating in Torres Straits between Australia and New Guinea. Confidential. Japanese fishing boats with antennas for shortwave transmitting and receiving have been spotted in Malacca Passage between the Celebes and the Moluccas. Confidential. Japanese fishing boats are still anchored in the Straits of Makassar between Borneo and the Celebes. They've not moved for ten days. We believe they are taking soundings. Confidential. A powerful big Japanese motor launch has made contact with three Japanese fishing boats in the Sunda Sea, east and northeast of Singapore. Patrol planes scanning the seas kept a close watch on the fishing boats. When the planes came upon the boats suddenly, they sometimes spotted radio antennas rigged aboard them. But when they turned around and came back for a closer look, the antenna invariably were gone. Only when the boats violated territorial waters could they be brought in. Patrol headquarters. 
headquarters says that this is one of the three boats that made contact with a big Japanese motor launch, sir. Is there any evidence that it also made contact with Japanese vessels? None that we know of, sir. We brought it in because it was inside territorial waters. Yes, yes, I understand. But not much question that it's been used to collect information and do intelligence work. And for smuggling. Mm, that's the sideline. We've uh, searched the entire boat, sir. This is what we've found. Opium, eh? Yes, sir. There's not very much of it. Did you find a transmitter? Not a transmitter, no, sir. But there's a place below where they had one rigged. Oh, probably dumped it overboard when they were overtaken by our vessel. Yes, sir. Well, take the crew ashore and put a guard on the boat until we can make a complete investigation. There will be probably international complications unless we can bring a definite charge against these three uh, Japanese... Your pardon, sir. Yes? Uh, this Japanese here, he's the captain of the boat, wants to speak with you. Very well. Uh, bad weather is blowing up. We request that you permit us to move the boat across the estuary to the shelter of the docks. Across the estuary? The boat would not be safe here in a storm. Well, there should be no objection to that. Holly? Yes, sir? Let the crew take the boat across the estuary under guard. Then have the guard bring in the crew. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. We are very grateful for the consideration you have. The Japanese fishing boat with three guards aboard headed out across the estuary as the storm blew up at twilight. Two hours later, one of the guards, dripping wet, made his way back to headquarters. We were out about in the middle of the estuary when it happened, sir. It was getting rather dark, and the water was pretty choppy. I don't know exactly what happened, but they must have jumped on us all at once. The first thing I knew, we were in the water, three of us. They must have knocked the other two out because they went down within a couple of minutes. The last thing I saw was that Jap boat heading down the estuary and out to sea. <laughs> From the many fishing boats at sea and from the carpenters and barbers and photographers ashore, information funneled into the Japanese headquarters on Formosa and into the military high command in Tokyo. And as assiduously as they worked at this, they also worked on something else, propaganda. The longer you cooperate with these white oppressors, the worse off you are. This was the line of the Japanese propaganda. You, like us Japanese, are oriental. The heel of the oppressor is on you as it is on us. Many listen to the Japanese. Do not be deceived by the oppressor. If you support them, you are only tightening the yoke about your neck. They wish to keep you down so that they can export you for their benefit. They are against us because they know that they cannot deceive us. But what will you Japanese do for us? We will see that you profit by your own labor. We, all of us Orientals, will work together for prosperity. And as one of us is prosperous, all of us will be prosperous. This can never be until we are free. Japan will free you. Some believed what they were told. Others were cynical. But with books and papers and pamphlets, the propaganda continued. And while some of the propaganda was spread by Japanese... Much of it was spread through natives in the pay of the Japanese. And much of it was spread by rumors. The Japanese are coming down to take Singapore and all Japanese Malaya. Japanese are getting ready to come down through Indochina and Thailand and take all of Southeast Asia. Japanese are going to take in Dutch Indies. Did you hear Japanese soldiers have already landed in Borneo and up above us in Malaya for quite a Did you hear the Japanese are going to throw out the British and the French and the Dutch and take you over You better all cooperate with the Japanese here now or when the Japanese army comes in, you will lose everything. Rumors filled the air. Gradually, there was no way to tell truth from fraud. If the Japanese are coming, we had better learn to get along with them. How do you know they are coming? The carpenter Hikotaro Ogawa said so. How does Hikotaro Ogawa know? He knows about many things. He says many things, as he says he is a carpenter. But did you ever see him do any carpenter work? How does he get his money? You are being stubborn and foolish. The credulous natives became unwitting informers on the less credulous ones. And the Japanese agents, like Hikotaro Ogawa, reported their information to the Japanese consul. Oh, it is not that he is against us, Mr. Nikko. He simply does not believe. Oh, he has considerable influence among his people. Has he not? A great deal. Yes. Yes. We will invite him along with the others to visit Japan as our guest. I will see that he is invited through the proper channels... In Japan, the two Malay leaders were lavishly entertained, showered with gifts, indoctrinated with the Japanese concept of the greater East Asia co-prosperity, and they were watched. 
One responded to this indulgence. The other did not. You will completely ignore the one who does not respond. He is to be regarded as an outcast. Do you understand? The other was fated and indulged. And when he was thoroughly indoctrinated, was returned to his home with honors. For the edification of those of his people over whom he wielded some influence, he published, at the behest of the Japanese, a pamphlet of his experiences in Japan. Among the peoples of the earth, none are so hospitable as the Japanese. None so courteous. None so masterful in the art of living. The gentle little people with the cherry blossoms. What nation has made such spectacular progress as Japan? He's quoting almost verbatim what the Japanese taught him. The cream of the Japanese youth is engrossed in the great task in China. I had been told that because of this, Japan's vigor had ebbed away and that the Japanese people were in despair. But when I stepped ashore in Japan, I found that was not true. Every piece of ground that could be tilled was under cultivation. The industries were busy day and night. Now, I have come back to tell you that Japan has showed us the way. And if we are to prosper with Japan, it must be our way. We have taken him completely in. Under the surface, the Japanese fanned every small spark of discontent. To drive a wedge between the native peoples and the various administrations, they directed their attention not only to the economic life of the peoples, but also to their religion. The Japanese understand us Muslims, and they understand our way of life. We must draw closer toward them. For they are the protectors of Islam. This was one of the young Muslims sent by the Japanese on a pilgrimage to Mecca in Arabia. And who subsequently were used by the Japanese to spread the doctrine of the Japanese among the Mohammedans. But by 1940, the Japanese were becoming even bolder. There is Mr. Tomohashi, sir. Yes, thank you. Mr. Tomohashi, how do you do? Uh, how do you do? Uh, Mr. Tomohashi, could I see your papers? Oh, of course. Uh, here. Here they are. Thank you. Uh... You come here as a representative of the Yefuko Sangyo Company? Oh, yes, sir. Hmm. And what will you do while you are here? Oh, the company, the uh, Yefuko Sangyo, operates a fishing fleet here, as uh, perhaps you know. Oh, yes, yes, I know about your company. We sell uh, fish and uh, sell fish and uh, fishing tackles, and we sell marine engines and land engines, and we operate a farm. Yes, yes, and... I know all that, but what will uh, you do here? Oh, I am uh, an auditor. I have come here to look over our various properties, to figure depreciation, uh, you understand, and to estimate our replacement. Mm -hmm. Then your interest will be pretty well uh, restricted to the Yefuko Sangyo properties. Of course. Well, uh, that's all, Mr. Tanahashi. Here are your papers. Oh, thank you, sir. A good day. Good day to you. Good day. Well, what do you think, sir? That man is a Throughout his stay, Tomohashi was watched. He visited only the properties specified in his papers. The fishing boats, the warehouses, the shops, the foundry. But each time he made an inspection, he was visited by several people. And when his allotted time was up in Singapore, he prepared to leave. I am honored that you have come down to the harbor to see me off. Thank you, Mr. Tomohashi. I trust your visit has been uh, satisfactory. Oh, yes, uh, quite uh, satisfactory. Thank you. Well, uh, goodbye. Uh, just one moment, Mr. Tomohashi. Oh, hello, Harley. Hello, sir. Uh, Mr. Tomohashi, is this large envelope yours? Uh, the, uh, oh, uh, yes. Yes, sir. Where did Well, you... uh, unfortunately, the stevedore has dropped your luggage. One of your cases opened a bit, and this envelope fell out. No one noticed it until after the case had been closed and taken aboard ship. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, well, goodbye to you. Mr. Tomohashi, would you be good enough to come back to the office for this? Uh, unfortunately, I must board the ship immediately, so That I... uh, envelope, Mr. Tomohashi, no longer contains the charts and photographs that were in it. 
There's only scratch paper in it now. Oh, there must be some mistake. Excellent, Harley. For a moment, I was afraid you would not get here in time. It's unfortunate that we shall have to detain you, Mr. Tomohashi. I must have stayed on the ship. If you will just come along with us, Mr. Tomohashi, we will be able to check over these charts. And... Tomohashi had secured information, not only from his Japanese agents, but also from various of the native leaders. By the time he was released, the Japanese methods were clear. But now the war had broken out in Europe. Now Hitler had moved into the Low Countries, into Denmark and Norway. Now the Nazi hordes had swept over France. And now with Britain fighting for her life and France and Holland out of the war, the Japanese started their long-planned Nanshin Run, the march to the south. This was 1940. Now is the time to strike. The Japanese leaders traveled to Formosa to confer with the Japanese general staff. We know all of the native leaders. We know which ones we come depend on and which ones we must dispose of. We must continue to keep in contact with them. They believe, as we do, that the ideal opportunity will soon be here. The ideal opportunity is coming, but it is not yet time. Oh, we must take care, General, that the ideal time does not pass. Britain, nor France, nor Holland is able to carry on a war in the Pacific at this time. But they may be able to fight later. Not if our intelligence from Germany is to be relied upon. Go back. You will know in ample time when the ideal time comes. Through the last months of 1940 and the tenth months of 1941, astute observers saw the growing threat to Singapore, to Malaya, Thailand, and Burma, to the Dutch East Indies and the Philippines. The Japanese have now driven southward from their positions in northern Indochina and occupied all of Indochina. That puts the Japanese in the great port of Saigon, only a little more than 650 miles from Singapore. It is therefore imperative that... Nanshin Run, which had so long been a theory, suddenly became a reality. Two months after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese swarmed over Singapore. Over the radio, Japanese spokesmen addressed the peoples of the lands they occupied. We have come to liberate you, to make you a member in the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. Japan has no territorial ambitions. Japan fully respects the existing sovereignty of this land against which she has been compelled to take military measures. You need have no fear that the Japanese... Japanese carpetbaggers came in with the army. Men like Mr. Tomohashi, the auditor, and the Japanese who had worked so long underground now came out. Men like Mr. Nikko, the consul, and Mr. Ogawa, the carpenter. This area will be Japanized at once. This was Mr. Nikko. All schools have been closed. They will be opened one by one with Japanese in supervision. The Japanese textbooks we brought along will be used. The Japanese language will be composed. Western languages were to be barred. This was the first indication of what was happen in, to happen in this respect. The peoples of these territories which have now been liberated by the Japanese are still deeply imbued with the Western ideas of the Americans, the British, and the Dutch. You people must be purged of all these ideological influences. This was Mr. Tomohashi. The Greater East Asia War is a war of a thought and a culture. The eradication of American and a British influence is our most pressing, immediate duty. There will be And no... as for the Mohammedans, there was a message for them, too, from Mr. Ogawa, the carpenter who talked of Japan as the protector of Islam. Shinto will be introduced in all occupied lands. Shinto, the idolization of our emperor. For all practical purposes, the conquered lands became vassal lands to Japan. By design, they were to be not co-partners, but were to be Japanized, to be reduced to the same relationship as that of the Koreans to Japan. It must be realized, Mr. Tomahashi, that certain deep-seated animosity will be fostered by these measures. We are aware that it will take a year. But to accomplish that end with the greatest haste, we have set up social organizations, clubs of many kinds, to convert the native people. They are studying our history and our culture. And through this, they will come to see the wisdom of our way. Yes. But let us take care that we do not, in this process, Promote an actual dislike for all things Japanese. This 
is one aspect of the war in the Pacific. To present another, the National Broadcasting Company brings to the microphone Corporal Willard E. Hall, a former prisoner of the Japanese. Corporal Hall, who is 25, became a prisoner at the fall of Bataan. He was held first at Cabana Tuan and later in Davao. Last September, he was one of 750 prisoners loaded on a Japanese prison ship, presumably bound for Japan. The Japanese ship was torpedoed by an American submarine. Corporal Willard swam ashore. He suffered an injury to his left knee and today is still trying to gain back the 80 pounds he lost as a prisoner of the Japanese. He holds the Purple Heart in presidential citation with two oak leaf clusters. Ladies and gentlemen, Corporal Willard E. Hall. First, I want to tell you people, I'm darn glad to be back in the United States. In fact, I'm lucky to be anywhere. 32 months as a prisoner of the Japs was no vacation, but there were some compensations. In fact, the red-letter day of our imprisonment was when we received our first Red Cross supplies. The first packages arrived in January of 1943, and we acted like a bunch of kids on Christmas morning. We were paired off, and each two men received four packages to be divided between them. Each man received a package from the Union of South Africa, and there were also packages from America and Canada which were divided between the two men. We soon established a medium of exchange for items in these parcels, using a package of cigarettes as the basis of exchange. Every item in the package was valued at so many packs of cigarettes, and our trading and bartering were done on this basis. We also received a large amount of much-needed medical supplies. A year later, in 1944, we received four 11-pound packages from the American Red Cross through the International Red Cross. These were strictly American packages with all American food in them. I don't have to tell you folks how much they really meant to us. I just hope that those who are left behind are getting Red Cross packages. If they do, it simply will be because the Red Cross is on the job, as usual. The first thing anyone asks us is, how is the chow? Our main diet was rice and soup. In the morning, we were served a watery cooked rice, which we call lugao. At noon, we got a medium-sized fish can full of cooked rice plus one half canteen cup full of watery soup, which was made out of kang kong or commodities. The same meal was repeated for supper. At Davao, which was camp number two, there were many fruit orchards and banana groves. We were able to steal food and bring it into camp and cook it ourselves on small charcoal stoves, which we had made. If a man was fortunate enough to get a job in the kitchen, we did not have to worry about enough to eat. This was one place where a cook enjoyed his own cooking. There are a lot of other things I could say, but you know what I mean. The main thing, as far as I'm concerned, is that the Red Cross is doing a fine job everywhere. I'm thanking them again. Thank you, Corporal Willard E. Hall. You have been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific story, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. To repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific story, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator, Gain Whitman. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>